Good afternoon. My name is uh, Terry Blaschke. I'm an Emeritus Professor of Medicine and Molecular Pharmacology at Stanford University. And I'm pleased to be talking with Dr. Robert Leyenberger, who serves as Director of the Office of Research and Standards in the Office of Generic Drugs. Dr. Leyenberger and I are just going to have a few questions that we will discuss with one another. Welcome, Dr. Leyenberger. Oh, thanks. It's cool. I'm glad to be here today. Thank you. Uh, as a, a director in the Office of Generic Drugs, uh, I have several questions that I wanted to talk about in terms of, of the uh, concept of generic drugs and uh, in particular to discuss some of the things that you do in your office uh, with respect to the uh, regulation of generic drugs. And in looking at some of the information that's provided by the office, I'm wondering if you could discuss the differences between bioequivalents and therapeutic equivalents. Sure. So therapeutic equivalence is the most important promise that we make when we approve a generic drug. It's the idea that the generic drug can be freely substituted for the brand product without any inter intervention from healthcare providers. Therapeutically equivalent products provide the same safety and efficacy. So when we say a generic product is equivalent to the brand product, we mean that when you use the generic product, you'll get the same safety profile, the same efficacy profile as the brand product. So it's really the therapeutic equivalence is really the most important thing that we do at FDA. But specifically, bioequivalence is part of the determination of therapeutic equivalence. So most generic products have to conduct what we call a bioequivalence study. And this is a study where you compare the rate and extent of absorption of the brand and generic products. We, in, a sense, in, in essence, we look at how fast both products deliver the drug to the bloodstream, and we compare those statistically to determine that the products perform equivalently. So the bioequivalent study is probably the most important part of making a conclusion of therapeutic equivalence. But in summary, therapeutic equivalence is the conclusion that we make when we approve the generic drug. Bioequivalence is one of the many studies that go in to support that decision about therapeutic equivalence. Are additional clinical efficacy or safety studies ever required for a generic product application? And if so, when would you do that? So by the regulations that govern generic drugs, clinical safety and efficacy studies aren't really allowed in generic drug applications. So there are studies that we use, what we call clinical endpoint bioequivalent studies. So the studies in generic drugs always are designed to compare the brand and the pro generic product to ensure they're the same. So sometimes we'll use studies in patients that look at clinical endpoints, but we're never using those studies to demonstrate the safety or effectiveness of the generic drug. We're using them to compare the brand and generic product. So the core of our evaluations of generic drugs are always focused on equivalence. Safety and efficacy studies are done at the time the new drug is approved. The generic product has to show that they're equivalent to that brand product. They have to bridge between their product and the product that was used in the original clinical studies. That's how, we that's how we ensure that the generic products are safe and effective, but we don't do new safety and efficacy studies on the generic drugs. Now, a generic product always contains the same amount of active pharmaceutical ingredient as the innovator product. Are there particular excipients in generic drug products that uh, raise a concern with the uh, uh, with the uh, agency? So FDA always reviews the inactive ingredients as well as the active ingredients that are found in generic products. So generic products, they're allowed to have differences in their inactive ingredients or excipients, but this is part of the review when the generic drug product is submitted to FDA for evaluation. The first part of that review goes back to the bioequivalent studies I described earlier. We determine that these changes in active ingredients don't have any effect on the rate or extent of drug delivery of the active ingredient. But we also look at the safety of these inactive ingredients. So for generic drugs, the main way we look at the safety of the inactive ingredients is we look at whether that inactive ingredient has been successfully used in another FDA-approved product for the same route of administration at the same exposure level for the excipients. And when we know that that excipient exposure level is safe from that information, then we know it's okay to use in a generic product. If a generic company wanted to use an excipient beyond those known safe limits, then they would have to submit extra safety data to FDA in order for them to be approved, or we might ask them 
to instead submit their, their product through the new drug application pathway if we couldn't assure the safety of the inactive ingredients. So inactive ingredients are part of the evaluation of the generic drug, of every generic drug application review. Many generics are actually manufactured outside of the United States, especially in India and China. What is the FDA doing to assure the ongoing quality of such products? FDA is always, in, always concerned about the quality of every generic product that's approved. One key aspect of our new use of fee agreement that was just signed in 2012 is what's called inspection parity. And this is inspection parity between sites in the U.S. and overseas. And so the new user fee agreement provides resources to FDA to guarantee that the likelihood of a site being inspected is independent of its location, whether in the U.S. or overseas. And even before that is fully implemented, the manufacturing sites for generic drugs, wherever they are in the world, have to meet the same standards. If an inspector goes to a site in the U.S. or an inspector goes to a site in India, they apply the same standards and the products manufactured at those sites must meet the same standards of quality. But globalization of the pharmaceutical supply chain is something that, not, that doesn't just apply to generic drugs. It also applies to branded drugs as well. <clears throat> the, products that you the products that you take can be produced anywhere in the world. The drug substance might be produced in one country, the excipients in another, the final product may be assembled in a third country. So it's important for FDA to have a modernized product quality evaluation system that can ensure the safety of this entire global supply chain for all of FDA approved products. Let's go on to a slightly different topic. Uh, that is uh, transdermal systemic drug delivery. What are the criteria that are used for bioequivalence of a, a topical topically applied product that is used for systemic delivery? Because transdermal systems are intended to deliver drugs systemically, we use the same type of bioequivalent standards for transdermal systems as we do for tablets and capsules. We look at the pharmacokinetic profiles, we compare the total exposure and the peak exposure, what we call the AUC and the Cmax, to ensure that the blood levels that you get when you apply the brand transdermal patch are the same as those you get when you apply the generic transdermal patch. So those aspects of bioequivalence are completely the same. The PK metrics are identical. But transdermal systems are different. They're more complicated to manufacture, and they have a more complicated interface with the patient. So in addition to the pharmacokinetic studies for transdermal systems, generic transdermal systems also have to two, do two additional types of studies to ensure that they'll be therapeutically equivalent. They have to do what we call an irritation study. And in this study, you compare, we compare the irritation of the skin due to the brand product and the generic product to ensure that there's no significant difference in irritation. The third study that we do for transdermal systems is we do what's called an <coughs> adhesion study. So for a transdermal system to work, it's got to stick to the skin. If it peels off early, it's not going to deliver the drug needed. So we also do a study that compares the adhesion between the brand and generic products to ensure that they're equivalent. So transdermal bioequivalence involves the same pharmacokinetic exposure comparisons that we do for oral tablets and capsules, but has additional therapeutic equivalent studies related to the specific aspects of the transdermal dosage form. Many active agents are now administered as prodrugs. Could you discuss the criteria for approval of a generic version of a prodrug? Generic versions of prodrugs have to meet the same bioequivalent standards as drugs that aren't prodrugs. But when we are developing the standards for bioequivalence for a particular product, we have to make a decision. In the pivotal bioequivalence study, should we measure the exposure of the prodrug or exposure of the active ingredient? that is the result of the metabolism of the prodrug. And we make this decision on a case-by-case -case basis. We look very carefully at how the prodrug works when it's metabolized to form the active ingredient. But the goal, but since the goal of the bioequivalent studies is to ensure the formulations deliver the drug in the, to the same rate and extent, we generally prefer to measure exposure to the prodrug because we know that once you have similar exposure to the prodrug, then its conversion to the active ingredient will follow directly from the exposure to the prodrug. So FDA's default approach is to measure is to measure and compare exposure to the prodrug. But there are cases where it's not possible to measure the prodrug. For example, when the prodrug is converted to the active ingredient very quickly, and so in those cases, 
FDA would evaluate bioequivalence based on the active ingredient. But this is a case-by-case -case evaluation that's made by looking at each particular product to determine the most appropriate method to demonstrate bioequivalence. One final question that I have. Uh, what bioequivalents or other criteria are used for the approval of a generic product that is used for local airway delivery or given by inhalation for systemic or local effects? Bioequivalence of inhalation products is one of the most important areas that my research group is working on. We've recently provided guidance for the first guidance to provide information to generic sponsors on how to, demon how to demonstrate bioequivalence for inhalation products. And because of the complexity both of these products and where they're delivering drug to, this is a complicated multi-step process to show bioequivalence. So the first step in this bioequivalence evaluation is to evaluate what we call the device performance. So these are laboratory tests where we look at how much drug the inhalation device emits with each puff, what the particle size of that emitted material is, and how consistently the device emits drug from dose to dose. But this isn't the only part of bioequivalence. The second part is we look at the systemic exposure after a, a, after a person takes the product. So we measure how much of the inhala, inhala, inhaled drug appears in the blood. This is important both because it tells us that the drug has reached the lung, but it also tells us something about the systemic safety of the drug in terms of how much exposure a patient will receive from both the brand and the generic. And so if a product, a generic product is equivalent both in the laboratory testing and the pharmacokinetic testing, they still have to do a third set of tests to demonstrate equivalence. And this is because the product acts locally in the lung. So we do a test of lung function, we call it the FEV1 test, that measures how much the volume of air a person can expel after they've taken the drug. And we measure this over a relatively long period of time. In our most recent guidance, you have to do a four-week study. So you measure the FEV1 after four weeks of taking both the brand and generic product. So we compare the effect of the product on lung function, the pharmacokinetic exposure, and the in vitro performance of the products. And we put all of this information together. Then we have very strong confidence that those two products are delivering drug to the same regions of the lung. And that's the essence of our bioequivalence determination, that the rate and extent of drug delivery to the site of action is the same. And so for these more complicated products, it takes a lot of information to make that conclusion.